All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to NOVA's second Cannabis Conversation event. My name is Ralph Bouquet, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at NOVA, and I will be your host for this evening. Um, and so I just wanted to provide some quick context as to what we are doing here. Uh, the Cannabis Conversations are a series of uh, virtual events um, that are really focused on having conversations. Ooh, hold on for a second. Sorry about that. Um, but these are a series of virtual events that NOVA is hosting as part of our engagement campaign for The Cannabis Question, NOVA's new film that investigates the story of cannabis from the criminalization that has disproportionately harmed communities of color to the latest medical understandings of the plant. And so in this film, we examine the latest research to answer questions such as what risk does cannabis pose to the developing brain? How much do we know about its potential medical benefits? Um, the film is currently available to stream on the NOVA YouTube channel, and you can find the link in the comment section uh, of this video as well. So please make sure if you haven't seen that film already, uh, we encourage you to check that out. Um, and one thing that's important about this film is that there is so much uh, more for us to understand uh, cannabis than we could tell in that 55 minute documentary. So as a result, we launched these uh, Nova Cannabis Conversation events uh, as an opportunity for us to speak with special guests and to take a deeper dive into different aspects of cannabis science and policy as well. And so uh, last week we had our first session where we discussed uh, cannabis genomics and the genes that uh, change cannabinoids in different strains with Dr. Daniela Vergara. And tonight's event is titled Investigating Medicinal Uses of Cannabis. And for the next hour, uh, we will be learning about and discussing research on how effective cannabis is in treating the wide range of physical and mental health conditions that people are using it for, especially now with the recreational uh, or medicinal uh, use that's been legalized in I think now 38 states. And so now we're really trying, trying to look at the studies that are being done uh, to really sort of assess um, its efficacy in treating a wide range of conditions. And so I'm really very excited to introduce our featured guest today, uh, who is Dr. Stacy Gruber, uh, who appears in the film, The Cannabis Question, and is leading a massive research study uh, with people who are using medical cannabis for anxiety, uh, chronic pain, um, menopause symptoms, uh, other uh, conditions uh, at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts, which is a few minutes outside of Boston. And so um, I'm going to quickly go through her bio and then hand it off to Dr. Gruber um, to walk us through a presentation. And we're going to be uh, actually have some moments after that for questions. Um, but Dr. Stacy Gruber is the director of the Cognitive and Clinical Neuroimaging Corps at McLean Hospital's Brain Imaging Center and an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Gruber's clinical and research focus is the application of neurocognitive models and multi-model brain imaging to better characterize neurobiological risk factors for substance abuse and psychopathology, particularly disruptions of the frontal lobe. Dr. Gruber has been involved in the application of behavioral science to help shape policies regarding juvenile advocacy and defense, and her lab's work in adolescent development was part of the amicus brief leading to the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Roper v. Simmons, which states that it's unconstitutional to execute minors. Her ongoing initiative to educate policymakers, judges, attorneys, and the general public in the differences between adults and adolescents and the impact of cannabis on the brain has already had both local and national impact on policy formation. And Dr. Gruber directs the recently launched Marijuana Investigations for Neuroscientific Discovery, uh, aka the MIND program, all right, <laughs> which is designed to clarify the effects of uh, medical cannabis, um, which she denotes uh, MC, you'll see that in some of her slides as well, on brain structure, function, and quality of like. Um, and I'd also like to note that we actually recently published a, a digital video about uh, one of the MIND program studies on CBD and anxiety, uh, which you can now watch on the NOVA YouTube channel, and you can find the link to that uh, in our comments as well. And so. Again, if you're just joining us right now, my name is Ralph Bouquet. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at NOVA, and I'm joined by our featured guest this evening, Dr. Stacey Gruber. She is now going to launch a 25-minute presentation on her research um, at, at the MIND program in McLean Hospital. And after her uh, presentation, we will transition to a Q&A segment. So if you do have questions for Dr. Gruber, um, you can drop them using the Q&A feature on Zoom. If you're watching on Zoom, uh, you can also use the comment feature on uh, Facebook or YouTube, and we'll definitely try to get to as many questions as possible uh, during the next hour or so that we have together. And so with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Gruber. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited for your presentation and for the following uh, conversation. 
technical issue already. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll try to share a screen and see if that works. We'll see. Uh, let's give this a shot. Okay, we should see slides. Well, first, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who are joining us tonight and who may see this at some other time. Thanks for spending some time learning about uh, the medicinal uses of cannabis and what I like to remind people of what to keep in mind. Get it for the mind program? Um, I think basically at this point, you'd have to be under a rock not to notice that cannabis really is on everyone's mind. It's in our news headlines. Every day there's something else about legalization efforts and the rapidly expanding cannabis and hemp industries and what's the latest, greatest craze. We hear a lot about ideas for potential clinical applications. And on the other side, we're hearing an awful lot of concern uh, related to mitigating risk and harm for individuals who perhaps should not be exposed to cannabis or cannabinoids. Interestingly, though, when we say cannabis, we often mean many things. We have one word. We have the word cannabis or very often marijuana. In fact, states have medical marijuana laws. Um, but we have this one word and we use it really to describe almost anything that comes from the plant. The plant is incredibly complex and is comprised, the plant is cannabis sativa L, that's its real name, and there are over 400 known chemical constituents in the plant, 400. A hundred or so of these, actually probably at this point many more than a hundred, are termed phytocannabinoids. Phytocannabinoids are things in the plant that interact with our own system called the endocannabinoid system, basically a system of chemicals and receptors throughout the brain and the body. Now there are many phytocannabinoids, but there are two main players here these days that everyone is talking about. The most abundant and the most common are delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. This is the primary intoxicating constituent of the plant. For our recreational or adult use consumers who are intentionally looking to change their current state of being or to, quote, get high, this is what they're after. In contrast, uh, very often our medical patients who are not looking to get high are often looking for other constituents that may have therapeutic benefit without conferring intoxication. The primary one here that is on everyone's mind these days is cannabidiol or CBD. Again, a primary, but not the only non-intoxicating cannabinoid from the plant. There are dozens of what we call minor cannabinoids. I like to say they had a major impact because each of them may in fact have unique therapeutic potential as well. When I think about cannabis though, I'm reminded that it's complex. And when we think about products, and again, um, I think you can ask pretty much anybody, and as Ralph appropriately mentioned, you know, there are very, very few states without any access to cannabis, either for um, medical use um, or recreational slash adult use. So products range quite a bit, uh, depending on where you are in the country. And they can be plant derived, that is they come from the plant, and if they come from the plant, they can either be full spectrum, that means they contain THC, the intoxicating constituent of the plant, or one of them, and other cannabinoids, as well as things like terpenoids, uh, essential oils that give cannabis its characteristic scent and flavor profile, that also have their own biobehavioral effects, and flavonoids. Other, other uh, constituents as well feature into whole plant full spectrum products. There's also broad spectrum products, which are exactly the same, what they do is they pull out as much THC as possible so that it's non-detectable. This is very important for individuals who are either very sensitive to THC or who have jobs, for example, who uh, where they cannot be positive for THC. Because believe it or not, um, lots of products that you have probably seen for sale in lots of unusual places like your gas station have enough THC to actually give you a positive result, even though they perhaps are not marketed that way. There are also isolated compounds, a single compound called isolates. They can either be plant derived or non plant derived. An isolate is a single extracted, in the case of Epidiolex, an FDA approved medication for pediatric onset uh, intractable seizure disorders. Um, these are single, it's a single purified extracted compound, 99.3% purified CBD. You can also have non plant derived isolates, so cr something created in the lab. So products are complicated. And again, plant derived or non plant derived, and you need to be asking questions about full spectrum, broad spectrum, or isolate. The interesting thing about the differences between full and broad spectrum and isolates is that there are some who say that you need significantly lower doses of products that are full or broad spectrum than those that are isolates because of what we call the entourage effect. Uh, this is the potential synergistic action that happens in the presence of multiple cannabinoids, terpenoids, flavonoids, sort of everything in the plant working together. Bigger bang for the buck, if you will. 
I also like to remind people that cannabis can be used and is used in a variety of ways. This is not just an inhaled product where people are either smoking or vaping. Um, we think of conventional flower products, sure, and we have edibles and beverages. We also have concentrates, things that are designed to give the user a, quote, big bang for the buck. These are sometimes products that start life at 35, 45, 55% THC and go north. The highest one I've seen in our lab is about 94% THC, um, but designed to give the user a very large bolus of whatever the highlighted constituent is at once. Oils, tinctures, capsules, creams, topicals, and you got it, suppositories. By the way, not popular with our recreational consumers. Modes of use are also different. Of course, you can smoke or you can vape. You can also dab. That's typically how people are using concentrates. Things like um, uh, shatter, wax, dabs, etc. You, you typically use a dab rig to use these things. You can ingest, you can use uh, things transdermally or topically, and of course you can insert them or use them transmucosally. So it's important to remember that as important as it is to know what product you're using, because different products will confer different results and the mode of use will make a difference with regard to the uh, estimated onset of effects or what we call rise time, as well as the duration of effect. So when you use a, a route of an inhalation, so smoking or vaping, you get a very fast onset between one and 10 minutes typically, that can last up to two or four hours. Again, depends on the product. And it depends on a number of other things as well. Sublingual or oral mucosal administration, a little bit longer to get an effect, 15 to 45, can last 90 minutes to several hours. You can see where we're going here, right? So oral um, routes of administration, pills, capsules, edibles, one to three hours, one to three hours before these things often, quote, give you an effect, and they can last six to eight hours. Topicals, creams, balms, salves, and transdermals, again, this is more variable with regard to onset. And finally, transmucosal or suppositories, again, similar to the sublingual or oromucosal route of administration in terms of rise time. So it's important to remember, it's not one thing. Uh, what type of product you're using is important and it's used, cannabis is used for different reasons. And the reason that it's important to keep that in mind is that the goal of use typically drives product selection, not surprising. At first blush, People often say, well, recreational medical cannabis, you know, the products are the same. And, you know, I think the people are pretty much the same. If you take nothing else home from this, I want you to remember one thing. Recreational or adult cannabis consumers and medical cannabis patients are not the same. They are not the same. And here's why. Very important distinctions. Typically, the goal of your adult um, or recreational consumer is to change their current state of being. That's what they'll tell you. I'm looking to change how I feel. I'm looking to get high. No judgment here. That's the goal. On the other hand, our medical cannabis patients say, you know, I really don't want to get high. Most of them. Um, I'm looking to be able to drive my car without ex exquisite pain. I'm looking to be able to get through the night. I'm looking to, you know, I'm, I'm looking to address symptoms, to alleviate symptoms, not to get high. As a result, again, the constituent profile of the products they choose are different. Our con uh, recreational um, or adult cannabis consumers typically are looking for products high in THC. Remember, that's the primary intoxicating constituent of the plant. Um, <laughs> potency or the amount of THC in um, recreational products has increased exponentially um, over the past decade and a half. And we've seen significant drops in the amount, uh, a significant drop in the amount of CBD in um, recreational products. That's because that's not really the desired impact here. On the other hand, our medical cannabis consumers may choose products high in THC, but very often they're choosing products that are high in other cannabinoids, very often CBD or other cannabinoids that are touted to have specific medical benefits. Age of onset is also very different and in our group, in my lab, that's very important in our, our work in recreational consumers. Very often recreational uh, use begins in adolescence. Medical cannabis use with the exception of the pediatric onset intractable seizure disorder patients and pediatric, pediatric populations in general. Typically, these folks are over the age of 25. They're often middle-aged or older adults. What I like to say is beyond the period of neurodevelopmental vulnerability, or in, in our, our cannabis culture, their brains are, are not half-baked. They're, they're, they're done with regard to, to development or, or much further along. I also would like to remind people that most of what we know about cannabis, despite the fact that it's been around for thousands of years, comes from studies of young recreational consumers. Very, very important. This is just a sample of some studies we've conducted in my lab because we've spent 
many decades looking at the impact of recreational cannabis use on lots of different measures. Um, for example, measures of cognition and brain structure and function, etc. In general, I'm going to summarize all of it and say the following. When we look at individuals who use cannabis recreationally and those who don't, do we see differences? Yes, very often we do. Most often those differences are attributed to individuals who begin using early in life, that is, while their brains are still vulnerable, if that makes sense. Um, when we look at it in the aggregate, it appears that earlier onset of cannabis use in conjunction with higher magnitude and frequency of use all lead to more pronounced changes. That's basically due to exposure to what we believe is THC. Again, THC, the primary intoxicating constituent, typically the uh, cannabinoid associated with the deleterious effects of cannabis in general. So you see, when we see cannabis and we're worried about cannabis on the brain, because what we're really saying most often is THC. The brain is vulnerable during adolescence as it becomes mature, not just to cannabis, but to other substances, to alcohol, to illness, to injury, you name it, it's vulnerable. So it's not a surprise. So the big question I had after doing many decades of this work was what about adults using cannabis? for medical purposes? Would they have the same ex outcomes as our young recreational consumers? And the answer in short is perhaps not. The MIND program was launched in 2014 and it was designed um, as Ralph mentioned really for us to look at the impact specifically of medical cannabis use, despite the fact that it was re-legalized here in the United States, first in California in 1996 for medical purposes. I could find nothing in the literature that looked at the longitudinal impact of medical cannabis use, nothing. I found studies that looked at the use of cannabis for chronic pain or nausea and vomiting uh, and, and some other uh, um, specific symptoms, but nothing that was a long-term study and nothing that looked at cognition or your ability to perform certain tasks as what I would consider a primary outcome variable. So we were the first to do those things. We're also the first ever to do neuroimaging, that is to look at uh, brain structure and function and in vivo brain metabolite ratios of medical cannabis patients. We also have secured INDs or investigational new drug approvals, finally, um, to be able to do clinical trials of whole plant products that are designed and targeted to address specific conditions and symptoms. So we have a number of those and I'll show you some of that work. Um, but again, the program itself supports a number of projects designed specifically to look at the impact of medical cannabis. We're really on a mission. I like to say that the program supports a range of studies that generate ecologically valid and empirically sound data to try to help close the gap between policy and science. And in doing so, we're looking at the unique, rather synergistic effects of cannabis and, and its constituents to look at the efficacy of cannabinoids for specific conditions and indications. We're also, of course, McLean Hospital is a private psychiatric hospital. We're very interested and incredibly concerned about potential impact on mental health. Overall, the goal is to improve patients' well-being and to harness therapeutic potential while minimizing risk and harm associated with treatment. So very quickly, I'm going to take us through a whirlwind tour of some of our studies, our observational, longitudinal, and survey studies first, just to give you a little sample. The first study we started was a longitudinal observational cannabis uh, medical cannabis study that looks at patients um, as well as treatment as usual folks. So these are folks who have conditions and indications similar to those who want to use medical cannabis but who are not using medical cannabis. And we assess clinical state, cognitive performance, quality of life, pain, sleep, conventional medication use, and of course where we can, neuroimaging measures. We also have a longitudinal study of older adults who are using opioids for chronic pain who then go on to use or don't use uh, medical cannabis as well as benzodiazepines uh, and opioids. We're looking very closely at the change in these types of things over time. We also have a quasi-clinical trial of veterans who choose to use a conventional, excuse me, a commercially available hemp-based product uh, made by the Charlotte's Web Company. And we look at veterans who are choosing to initiate the use of this product who are either cannabis naive or, or who are already using it. And we look at how that changes over time. So back to the first longitudinal observational study, this was really pretty exciting. And the goal here is to look at all of these different outcome variables, cognitive performance, mood, sleep, conventional medication use, et cetera, in individuals before they begin using. Let me say this again, they're cannabis naive at baseline. Doesn't mean they've never tried cannabis. It means they're not using cannabis currently. And they have to have been absent from cannabis for a minimum of a year. We follow these folks, we see them at baseline, we assess everything we can, and we see them again at three months, six months, 
uh, 12, 15, 18, and 24 months. We've now just submitted a request to go out to three years. I have to tell you, when I started the study, we weren't sure we'd get people past three or six months. Um, it's been amazing, and the journey has really been rather extraordinary. We have monthly phone check-ins. Our patients can use medical cannabis for any indication that they are interested in using for, and again, they have to have a certification or recommendation or a desire to use products that don't require this. They complete these assessments at each time point, assessments of clinical ratings, their pain, mood, anxiety, sleep, quality of life. You're gonna see a really common theme here throughout. Um, we have very detailed information that we collect about their medical cannabis use, product type, frequency, amount, where they got it, what the COAs say, their conventional medication use, of course, measures of cognitive performance and neuroimaging. I will tell you their most commonly used products are also analyzed by an outside lab because as their study doctor, I can't give them those products, but we wanna know, quote, what's in their weed. We've published a number of studies from the MIND program, and I'm gonna show you some data from the first two longitudinal studies of medical cannabis patients. The first was Splendor in the Grass in 2016, our pilot study, and then more, much more recently, MC and Cognition that looked at an entire year's worth of data. So patients over the whole course of a full year. So the state of the science, basically previous studies had indicated that medical cannabis could be effective for mood-related symptoms, for example. There was an early case study that looked at some individuals who reported that cannabis successfully improved their mood. In our pilot study, we took that a step further, and we actually had the first longitudinal study of medical cannabis patients between baseline and three months, and we saw clinical and cognitive improvements between baseline and three months improvements. There were other studies that primarily used um, app-based survey approaches so people are completing these things on an app they're not seeing them face to face like we do but what these studies by cutler and and, and lee reported were that individuals um, experienced some antidepressant effects after using medical cannabis so in our longitudinal study when we look at data over the course of the year i'm happy to tell you palms is the profile of mood state total mood disturbance score and every place you see an asterisk means there was a statistically significant decrease in mood disturbance. So baseline to three and six and 12 months all significantly improved. The Beck depression inventory, same thing. Significant reductions in self-reported measures of depression. With regard to anxiety, we see previous studies suggesting that there may be a role here for medical cannabis use and anxiety related symptoms. Important to remember THC has bi-directional effects. A word to the wise. Low doses of THC can be anxiolytic. That is, it helps with anxiety. Higher doses, anxiogenic. It can actually make things much worse. And I know I probably don't have to tell anybody here um, what that's like because everybody has either had that experience or knows a friend. Um, there have been a number of studies, including a recent clinical trial, showing that CBD may be effective at reducing anxiety. In our studies, again, the MIND longitudinal study, back anxiety inventory over time, we see some significant improvements between baseline and six and baseline in 12 months. Same is true for trait-related anxiety, again, over time. So pretty compelling. With regard to sleep, um, there was a recent review that summarized the effect of cannabinoids on sleep, suggesting that it may improve both sleep quality and what we call sleep disturbances or sleep coherence. Um, importantly, though, most studies only look at improvements in sleep as a secondary or tertiary outcome. We think of it as primary. In fact, think of any condition that doesn't impact sleep, I challenge you. Um, so the PSQI, um, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, we also look at sleep over time and we see significant improvements between baseline and three, six, and 12 months of use. With regard to quality of life, there have been some studies suggesting that folks using for chronic pain report significant improvements in their quality of life after starting medical cannabis treatment, and we see the same thing. With regard to physical and psychological health, statistically significant improvements over time, no huge change in environment or social relationships um, in, in this particular scale. So interesting, we don't expect everything will change. Um, when we get to cognition, again, sort of one of our, our linchpins here, there have been dozens of studies and tons of ours that have looked at the impact of recreational cannabis use on cognitive performance. And um, mostly what we see are um, decrements on tasks requiring things like executive function. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. But there are inherent differences between recreational and medical cannabis use. So the question was, would medical cannabis patients exhibit the same patterns of, let's say, difficulty with certain tasks, particularly those that require executive function, which are uh, mediated by the frontal cortex, right behind your, your eyebrows? Um, 
until our study, there were really no studies that looked at cognition as, again, a primary outcome variable um, and nothing that was longitudinal and looked at change over time. So here are some examples of executive function tasks. So the Stroop color word test where people have to inhibit reading and instead name the color of the ink a word is printed in. Uh, letter number sequencing, you get a jumble of numbers and letters, you have to repeat them in order, numbers and letters. Wisconsin card sorting tasks, sort cards in order, and then a, the rule will change and you don't know when it, or, or what the rule is. You have to use the feedback from your examiner to change your behavior. And what we see over time is instead of decrements, as we've seen in our recreational consumers, we see significant improvements in certain aspects of cognitive performance, which is really quite striking. Uh, between baseline and three, six, and 12 months, for example, in time to complete that Stroop interference effect, the number of total categories achieved in the Wisconsin card sort, letter number sequencing, total number correct. So this is a really interesting um, and very compelling um, set of data for us. In the grass might be greener, we actually looked at patterns of brain activation and how they may change um, after being uh, exposed to medical cannabis. So what do people look like when they're performing some of these tasks? Well, good thing we have an MR scanner right on site. Um, the multi-source interference task is a, another task that we give to folks while they're being scanned. And there's two conditions. The control condition, pretty straightforward. It's basically a grown-up game of one of these things is not like the other. Tell me the identity of the number that's different with a button press. And in the control condition, the target number that's different is always in the correct position as on the button box, so not hard. In the interference condition, though, Subjects have to inhibit the position of the number and instead report the identity. It's harder than it sounds. I'll cut to the chase. Results from this very first neuroimaging study uh, demonstrated that relative to baseline or before they use medical cannabis, we see notable increases in frontal activation, including a region typically activated by healthy controls, people who don't use cannabis after three months of medical cannabis use. So you can see on the left, response time is significantly faster. Um, and accuracy is significantly higher between baseline uh, and three months. And at visit one versus visit two, that's what we see in terms of patterns of activation. And that's very similar to a pattern we see in 2012 when we looked at healthy controls. So pretty interesting, I have to say. Moving forward uh, with regard to individuals who are using cannabis for pain or medical cannabis for pain, we did see improvements, which were accompanied by improvements in sleep, mood, anxiety, and quality of life and stable conventional medication use over three to six months. We know that THC and CBD are both implicated in anti-inflammatory processes and in pain relief. And in the 2017 NASM report, there was conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids could be effective for chronic pain. But to date, most investigations of plant-derived products have utilized either surveys, like retrospective surveys, or acute administra administration paradigms where they actually um, basically take individuals who don't have pain and create um, a situation where they feel pain. <laughs> in our study of chronic pain patients over the course of three to six months of treatment, our patients with chronic pain reported significantly decreased ratings of pain on a number of scales between baseline and three and then baseline and six months. Again, very, very compelling. When we look at other comorbidities, we also see significant improvements in sleep, mood, and anxiety again in the same cohort. Between baseline and three months, we saw significant changes um, in sleep and depression. And oops, I think it popped ahead. That's okay. Obviously, I'm going too slowly. My slides want me to go faster. Um, often people raise the question about cannabis use disorder. If you're using medical cannabis, how likely are you to develop cannabis use disorder? And we've certainly heard a lot about this. And interestingly, some of the screening tools that people use to determine whether you have cannabis use disorder are not necessarily appropriate for medical cannabis patients. Almost exclusively, they were developed for use in recreational uh, cannabis samples. So that's important. But when we look at our folks, we look at patients who have completed what we call the QDIT. And what we see are scores that do not even approach hazardous use or possible CUD or cannabis use disorder. You do see an increase in the numbers though. And when we did an item by item analysis, what we found was the increased ratings were attributed to increased frequency of use. You start off with a four if you report using cannabis every day. Most people are using their quote medicine every day, therefore they start life with a four. So you can see that blue line up at the top is frequency. So that told us that this was really truly um, not necessarily um, a well-validated screening tool for medical patients, for 
uh, recreational consumers, maybe. So we need metrics and they're underway, specifically designed for medical cannabis patients. So overall, in terms of the longitudinal data, what we see are the clinical data showing us significant areas of improvement, including mood, anxiety, sleep, and quality of life. We generally see improved performance on measures of executive function, particularly important since our rec folks um, demonstrate decrements in uh, tasks requiring executive function, especially those who begin using early. We also see decreases in the use of conventional medications or stable use of medications, no increase. And the subset of folks with chronic pain report improvements in pain as well as other areas. We see few signs of problematic use and potential normalization of brain activation. So pretty interesting. We're doing a number of survey studies, including one focused on COVID-19 and medical cannabis use the use of a commercially available product on menstrual cycle symptoms and cannabinoids for men menopause related symptoms, um, as Ralph mentioned. And I'm happy to tell you we're doing a number of clinical trials. Um, we have a number of INDs in hand. Uh, the, I'm just going to show you a quick sneak peek of um, a, day, a, a an open label to double blind trial that um, is underway. This was basically done in conjunction um, with um, a sourced extract that I wound up using from NIDA, but I do work with industry partners and I always have a chemist with some cannabis experience on board as well. Um, but basically I get something that looks like the top left panel and I have to make it into something our patients can use. Um, the clinical trials currently are cannabis derived high CBD formulations for anxiety. I'm gonna show you that data in a second. Um, we also have uh, CBD for anxiety and agitation and Alzheimer's uh, dementia which is pretty exciting. A hemp derived high CBD formulation for anxiety in conjunction with industry partners and a number of pending trials. There's no shortage of work in this area. The quick sneak peek, basically my clinical trial looking at the high CBD product for anxiety, it's a whole plant full spectrum product and now you know what that is. And it basically is an open label to double blind trial design because it had never been done before. I wasn't sure what the dose should be, how often they should have it, et cetera. So we had some, some wiggle room. It's basically a four week study of active treatment and it's approximately 10 mg per mil of CBD along with a number of other cannabinoid constituents. You also know why that's important and a full terpenoid profile. It's a sublingual administration. TID dosing means they get it three times a day. What we basically see, really, really interesting. Between baseline and four weeks, we are seeing 70 to 80% reduction in anxiety-related symptoms, a 60 to 80% improvement in mood-related symptoms, for example, scores on the BDI or back depression inventory, improvements in sleep and quality of life. Really quite striking. Uh, the data revealed very similar cognitive findings as what I showed you in the observational study. Basically, no one's getting worse. People are, are getting better over time. We also don't see any significant adverse events or intoxication. That's really, really important. We did see positive uh, urine screens for THC in exactly half the sample after four weeks, despite the fact, despite the fact that nobody was intoxicated, important to keep in mind. And the double blind phase, which is now finally underway, is ongoing and will definitely give us more definitive results. The open label data is amazing, but it's open label data. And you know the role of expectancy can't be ruled out here, although we did assess for that and didn't see a relationship. So it's important to remember anecdotal and limited scientific evidence suggests there's potential for cannabinoid-based medicine to play a role in treating many symptoms and conditions, but we need to overcome barriers and conduct empirically sound research to be able to draw conclusions. How do we do that? Well, first, you can join our ongoing efforts and support research initiatives. You can get involved, spread the word, ask questions, visit themindprogram.com to learn more. And remember this, without vision, we have no ability to move forward. So we often have to think outside the box, even if it's difficult. And it's not about what we think or feel about cannabis. This has to be driven by science. Let science drive the decisions that are made, not rhetoric, not what you think and feel, what the data show us. And with that, I would thank you for your time and turn this back over and tell you, I couldn't do any of this work without my amazing team. Um, it literally takes a village, trust me. Um, they are extraordinary every single day. And this is the most important work I've ever done and probably will ever do and all I ever want to do. And I'm so incredibly honored and, and really fortunate to do this work with folks who feel exactly the same way and who are as devoted to our patients, I think, as I am. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gruber. Sure. That was uh, an incredibly informative presentation. And I think I think you really, uh, really made the case for, I think, the importance of us considering sort of what it means to actually close the gap between policy and science. I think this is um, 
you know, a big part of this project and even of the film is to really think about how we could use, you know, this information, this data, uh, again, that empirical knowledge to really inform our practices and to really inform the decisions that we're making, uh, both sort of personally, but also sort of, uh, you know, nationally as well when it comes to these conversations and the ways in which, um, you know, these issues are impacting communities. So we have a lot, a lot of questions and I did want to uh, get one in my, uh, get one of my questions sure. in, but I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, and this is something that came up even in our previous conversations, um, is about sort of the role that regulation plays in understanding sort of the eff efficacy and the consistent efficacy, you know, of, you know, medicinal cannabis that, that exists. Um, but my question is sort of the, the medicines that we take over the counter or that are prescribed to us, um, they go through very rigorous testing uh, that also considers sort of drug interactions with other substances. Um, is there anything that we currently know about potential drug interactions with medicinal cannabis? And what are the, you know, the challenges to really doing this research effectively as well? So I think that's a, a great question. And I'm often hit with the, hey, you know, it really can't hurt me, right? Um, and I always say, listen, there's the good, they're bad, and then there's the truth. And it's important to remember that, for example, conventional medications are often evaluated for what we call DDIs or drug-drug interactions. Cannabis is, um, unfortunately, sits in Schedule 1, the most restrictive of the Controlled Substance Act. So it's a little bit more difficult when we think about the ways in which we have to study cannabis. Um, Hemp-derived products fought in a different category, so we'll leave them to the side. But again, I'd say my second big take home message, if there should be one, is that um, individual cannabinoids, including THC and CBD, interact with something called the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. Okay, that's the system, that's the enzyme system of your liver that processes drugs, basically. So inadvertently, you could increase or decrease the amount of certain drugs in your system. It's very, very important to know which drugs might be contraindicated to using, for example, high doses of CBD. How could it hurt me? It can only help me. I'm here to tell you that for some people using some medications, that isn't really necessarily true. And we must always remember the potential risk. Um, so it's very, very important if you're taking certain medications to make sure um, that they are not contraindicated with the use of other things. We've all heard about, oh, I can't drink grapefruit because I'm taking X. That's exactly why. It's the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. No different here. So I want you to all remember that when you're thinking, oh, high doses of this will probably be fine. Let's check it out and make sure. Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that came up and several people have actually asked this question in the comments um, is really about the entourage effect. Um, this idea that sort of uh, the wide range of cannabinoids that exist in uh, in cannabis sort of, you know, have this uh, sort of uh, some of the parts is greater. Or is, that, is that the exact quote? But sort of there's yeah. a gestalt effect essentially um, sure. that happens when they all interact with each other. And so I guess one question, uh, and Paola from Zoom asked this question, um, what, what is, is there, what is the most convincing piece of sort of scientific evidence that you've seen to really support the existence of the entourage of effects? And a follow-up question about that is related to sort of edibles, like how do edibles, uh, if there is an entourage effect, how do, does that work with edibles since most of them are made from distillates um, as opposed to having, you know, the other cannabinoids that may exist like the terpenes and, and other things as well. So we're going to, we're going to take the second part second. I'm going to go with the first one first. So it's a great question. And in terms of the entourage effect, and this was something that was hypothesized many, many moons ago. And you, what you very often find are two schools of thought. Like we know, we really don't know that there's anything at all to the interaction of these things with each other, but here's something to keep in mind. There have been some studies that have demonstrated that lower doses of full or broad spectrum products result in efficacy relative to, again, higher doses required of isolate products. So that should tell you something. Um, if you need 600 mg, 800 mg of, quote, uh, purified CBD to get the same effect as a significantly lower dose of a whole plant full or broad spectrum product, that should tell you something that is not working on its own. Um, we actually have an arm of this particular study that's designed to address that exact question. So what you don't typically find are studies that have, let's say a whole plant full spectrum product compared to placebo. But what about a whole, um, whole plant full spectrum product with everything else pulled out except that one constituent that you think is responsible for the impact with everything else matched. So it came from exactly the same extract. We don't really have that data yet. We will um, <laughs> check back, but um, that that's a pretty compelling piece of evidence. I think if you get significant efficacy at lower doses with fuller broad spectrum products than single extracted compounds, that should tell you something. 
In terms of, sorry, so I forgot. The second, second part was about the edibles, right? So edibles are made with lots of different approaches. I want to tell you first and foremost, um, uh, when it comes from a, an extract or a distillate, remember it's going to have cannabinoids, terpenoids, flavonoids. Sometimes they're not, sometimes they are, it depends. Um, very, very often what people don't realize is that Delta 9 THC um, is intoxicating and you take something that's consumable and you wait, you wait 30 minutes, you wait 40 minutes. And I know we all know these stories. You don't wait long enough, you take more, Uh uh-oh, because now it begins to kick in at about 90 minutes, an hour, two hours, and you're thinking, I wish I hadn't done that. You won't die, you just wish you would die. Uh, It's very unfortunate. Um, Delta-9 is actually converted to something more intoxicating in the liver called 11-hydroxy. So when you hear people say, you know, it's weird, I'm getting, the, the longer this is going on, the more high I feel. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what happens, which is why it's important to start low and go slow. And edibles are the most difficult to dose um, and to um, sort of figure out where the sweet spot is, if that makes us, if that makes sense. So smaller doses are really um, indicated for most people, at least to start. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and Natalie from Zoom also has a question uh, similar to um, our previous one around edibles, but uh, she wants to know sort of has the data been disaggregated by consumption method uh, for any of these studies? And so are there forms of consumption that seem to be more effective uh, than others, particularly with regards to making sure that the right dose is delivered, uh, duration, any other effects you may be looking for? You know, so much depends on the goal of use. And if you're talking specifically about medical purposes, most people who have, for example, very, very acute uh, symptoms, so a flare of uh, rather tremendous pain, like terrible pain. Very often people don't want to wait an hour or two hours, so they might use a route of inhalation, uh, an inhalation route. So smoking or vaping will give you the fastest impact, right? Again, it doesn't last as long, um, but I, I think that there, we don't have a huge amount of what I would call aggregated data to this point. Again, there's no, we don't even have a common lexicon. When we talk about people who use, quote, regularly, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say heavy cannabis use? We have to define it in our studies. As scientists, we're forced to. But I've heard people say, you know, consistent cannabis use, like frequent cannabis use, you know, once every two weeks. Okay. Um, chronic heavy hitters from a recreational perspective in our studies are four or five of the last seven days. But we don't have a commonly accepted lexicon. How about a unit dose of THC? Again, everybody's worried about THC. Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado suggested 10 milligrams was a single unit dose. Our own government, uh, Dr. Nora Volkoff, our director of NIDA, um, I think is leaning into the, the five milligram dose because there's some evidence suggesting that is really the limit for many, many people. Let me remind everybody of one other thing. We are not all created equally when it comes to genetics and your genetic profile dictates how you process everything, right? So some people are very, very sensitive to the effects of THC. They might be poor metabolizers, which means it stays around longer. So you're going to feel an effect for a longer period of time, or you could be a rapid metabolizer or ultra rapid metabolizer. We're not all the same. So all of these things have to be factored into your equation. And so I think it'd be great if we had some grand aggregate database of roots of administration. Hey, if you have this best for that, I think people have general rules of thumb. Um, and, and certainly anecdotally, people will tell you that I'd love to see some real data behind that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of the same thing about the, the discussions regarding indica versus sativa versus hybrids. Is there really such a thing as a pure indica or pure sativa at this point? For those who don't know, um, chemovars or cultivars, quote, strains of cannabis are often um, touted for specific effects. Indica uh, chemovars or, or cultivars are um, thought of as the sort of whole body relaxing kind of chill, while uh, sativa plants are typically considered, quote, euphorogenic, and I want to make, I want to go, I want to, you can fill in the blank. Um, and hybrids, of course, are, are a blend of those things. But most people in the field will tell you at this point, it's very difficult to determine if there's really <laughs> any pure this or that at this point. And most things are at least some semblance of a hybrid. Um, so I think there's a lot we don't know yet. And, and to that point, I, I think um, this idea of sort of uh, the chemotype, essentially, right, um, based off of the profiles of the cannabinoids, sort of, um, that is, I think, what many people may be sort of making decisions about for what they may use, whether it's recreation or medicinally. Um, in your studies, uh, have you been able to, and this is a question um, from Ryan from Zoom, um, have you retained any sort of samples uh, of the plants or medicine uh, from the studies you've conducted? And are you able to sort of control for 
you know, the wide variety um, in the chemotype of those plants that are being used uh, by these medicinal patients? A great question. So here's the thing. In the longitudinal observational study, it's a great point. Remember that folks are choosing their own products. That means they get it where they get it. They're told whatever they're told. The labels say whatever they say. When mm -hmm. And wherever we can, we have a sample of their most commonly used products submitted to an outside lab for what we call cannabinoid constituent profiling. That means the quote, what's in your weed is known to us. How much THC, CBD, CBC, CBG, THCV, you can go down the list, how much is present of each or any of these things. So we can keep track when the data is large enough, that is when we have enough of what I would call a real sample size, you can actually look at the impact of specific cannabinoids. We can already look at the impact of what we call a high THC regimen versus a higher CBD regimen. I will say this, in the study that, um, that we looked at over a year, the, the folks that I showed you the data from for cognitive and clinical change, by and large, those people were taking more CBD than THC. That's really important. But when we looked specifically at some of the relationships, we didn't see a direct impact of any of the constituents on cognition per se. What we did find was a specific relationship between some of the cannabinoids and mood, which probably as a downstream effect allows people to perform better. Why are people getting better? People will tell you I'm using less conventional medication, so I'm not as fuzzy. My symptoms are addressed. I'm not in chronic pain. I'm getting some sleep. I don't feel so anxious, so I can learn better. Um, or, you know, maybe there's some other direct mechanism that's happening with result to exposure to these cannabinoids, all to be determined. That's great. I, I think um, there are several questions actually that folks had uh, about uh, your study um, looking at Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and sort of the impacts of, uh, I think you're testing CBD use um, with, uh, with dementia from Alzheimer's. Um, and I think the question, I think some people are sort of wondering about first, uh, you know, the efficacy that you've seen um, for CBD use with Alzheimer's and also is there, are there any sort of potential preventative uh, effects? I mean, this is a longitudinal study. So of course we need to have a lot more time to sort of understand that, but is there anything to hint at evidence of any preventative um, sort of impacts, particularly when it relates to something like dementia from Alzheimer's. Sure. So it's a great set of questions. There was more than one question buried in there. Nice try there. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the Alzheimer's trial is actually, it's a clinical trial. It's not longitudinal. It's an acute administration, well, not acute administration. It's a clinical trial. Um, mm -hmm. And then we allow people to continue using a different commercially available product um, if they so choose after the trial is complete. And we're at very, very early stages of this study. The reason that we did this study was because anecdotally, all great discoveries begin with, oh yeah, anecdotal evidence, right? Has to start somewhere, um, that for agitation and anxiety, in general, what we see are mitigating, so we, we see a reduction of symptoms in people who are exposed to some of the non-intoxicating cannabinoids, specifically CBD, and I have another one or two that I have in my back pocket that I think are going to be amazing for this. So Alzheimer's related anxiety and agitation is particularly difficult to address and is absolutely um, impossible at some levels, sometimes for the caregivers, for the patients themselves. So the question is, what can we do to help? So before we get to the prevention, can we at least address some symptoms of anxiety and agitation? I would say it's very, very early on. My hope is that the answer will be yes. As a preventative, there have been some interesting preclinical studies and some studies that come from not the US, but other countries suggesting um, what I would call um, some benefit to some exposure to certain cannabinoids. I think that's about as general as I could probably be. Um, you know, is there something to be said for neuroprotection? People have made this claim and people have, again, touted the benefits of certain cannabinoids for lots of different conditions, indications, and diseases. I think we're still in very, very early days, but there's every reason to be absolutely hopeful um, that there is a, a lot of potential here. Um, first and foremost, I think if we can make people more comfortable in the here and now, that's great, especially given where we are all um, in our COVID, <laughs> COVID world. Um, anxiety is off the charts. People are experiencing um, more disruption than at any time we can remember. So it's very, very important to have things to try to help people feel a little bit better. Prevention mm -hmm. and sort of mitigating or, or, or staving off what could be, quote, the inevitable from a genetic perspective is a different question. I certainly hope that would be true. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, a, a few people have asked questions around, um, you mentioned uh, several times in your presentation, 
um, the impact and the connection between adolescence use uh, for recreational users and sort of, you know, the, the neurobiological impacts um, sort of over during the course of the rest of your life uh, related to um, sort of the frequency of the use and, and, and sort of how early that usage happens. And so a few people wanted to know sort of um, are people who have who have been sort of episodically high use recreational cannabis users uh, since adolescence, are they in some way, shape, or doomed? Um, can the brain sort of recover? Is there some sort of elasticity that allows folks um, who may be worried or concerned about those neurological effects? Um, are there ways to recover uh, for folks who have um, who have encountered sort of high use uh, in adolescence? And have you seen any studies that point to uh, those changes being able to sort of recuperate over time? Sure, sure. And you know, there's some really great literature here from a number of my colleagues across the country, actually, that basically demonstrate. And again, let's be very clear. This is not any cannabis use here or there. Chronic, heavy, regular cannabis use when you are, quote, neurodevelopmentally vulnerable. So you begin using at 12, 13 or earlier and you continue using. What happens if you stop using? It appears that with abstinence, that is with, you know, sort of stopping your cannabis use or significantly reducing it, you do see changes in cognitive performance and some other things, uh, some other areas that would suggest that you absolutely um, quote recover. I think from from the question of neurotoxicity, it's one that it's important to keep in mind. Um, that said, it's not the case that every person who uses cannabis develops a problem. In fact, not at all. In fact, the individuals in our adolescent and emerging adults onset group, we were looking at them as adults, but the people who began using later looked much more like the non-cannabis users than the early onset folks. It really seems to us a question of sort of how early you start, how much, and how often. But if you stop, there's every reason to think that you will, quote, get it back if you've lost anything. Not that everybody loses. Absolutely not. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, another question is related to this idea of tolerance, um, sure. uh, particularly for, for, uh, for people who have... Who, have heavy usage of cannabis. Um, in your studies, particularly with the medicinal patients, um, have you seen sort of any development in, an, or rather a need for uh, perhaps stronger concentration of THC in medicinal cannabis in order to have the same effect? And, and is that sort of a, an issue that, um, particularly for medicinal patients, is that something that you've seen in the studies? So we haven't seen a ton of it, I'll be honest with you. And I think that's probably a function of, again, medical cannabis patients are often choosing products that have a fairly varied cannabinoid profile. That said, do you get used to the same thing day after day after day after day with regard to what it is? Again, botanicals often have a fair amount of variance. That is, you know, this uh, particular product that you go and get yourself, you know, from this particular dispensary versus that particular dispensary may have enough variability that you don't have that. Uh, with regard to exposure to THC, and there are, again, you know, we always hear um, CBD, oh, it's therapeutic, um, and nobody, there's very low abuse potential or liability, right, because it's not, it's not rewarding in the same way, and THC really, we shouldn't consider it. THC has medical benefit for a number of people. In fact, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report in 2017 didn't look really at CBD. We didn't really have that data at all. They reviewed over 10,000 studies. They were looking at the use of THC, either plant-derived or synthetic, for conditions. And they found chronic nausea and, and vomiting as a function of chemotherapy. Muscle spasticity as a function of MS and chronic pain were all addressed with the use of THC. Um, and then we called the big three plus one pediatric onset seizure disorders um, were addressed by uh, CBD in the form of epidiolex. Um, but do people develop tolerance? They certainly can. Very often varying your um, regimen slightly will help adjust that. It's not that you need a whole lot more of this. You may need something different. And I, I highly recommend people really look at the COAs or the certificates of analysis of the products they're getting and try to figure out what may be making the difference here because you can save yourself a lot of hop skipping and jumping across if you can sort of identify what, what might be at play here. Mm -hmm. Great. So we are coming up to the end of our session and I'll have, I just, I think this is one question that I had that I think sort of summarizes, um, and I hope can summarize sort of, you know, what you found as the sort of the most promising thing from your studies. Um, but uh, you're currently doing numerous studies through the MIND program, uh, you're looking at anxiety, Alzheimer's related dementia, um, all these, I mean, so many sort of different conditions. Um, do you have any of these studies sort of change our understanding of these conditions? And I ask that because um, in the film, we talk a lot about the endocannabinoid system and how sort of, you know, the discovery of that system sort of helped to 
really rethink and reshape our understanding of um, you know, of the systems in our bodies that are used to really modulate stress and that really play a very important homeostatic role. Um, has anything come up from these studies that you think um, will change our understanding of these conditions and, and that shows sort of the most promise with regards to understanding uh, the ways in which uh, cannabis can be applied uh, medicinally? I think the one overarching thing I would say about that is we are finally at a point where we actually can collect empirically sound data to help address some of the questions, as opposed to filling in the blanks with what we think or what we feel might work or might not work. Now we can actually ask some of these questions that are really difficult questions to ask, given how we have to study cannabis. I would say that while there have been these anecdotal sort of spurious things here and there with non-plant derived synthetically created CBD for folks with social anxiety, we are seeing major changes in people's lives using a whole plant full spectrum product. I would say that there is promise for a number of indications and conditions with regard to being able to target some of these things that plague so many who are treatment resistant or suffer from terrible side effects. So I think we're in a very, very different place now than we've been. I think we have seen some preclinical data suggesting that the endocannabinoid system as we age may benefit from a tiny little what we call tweaking of the ECS by exposing um, ourselves to small amounts of certain cannabinoids. There's a great uh, preclinical study of, of mice um, and showing basically showing exactly what we see in people. Biology is cruel. We get worse at tasks as we get older. And middle-aged and older, quote, mice didn't do as well as the younger mice on a task until a tiny small amount of THC was administered to the mice. And now middle-aged and older mice did much, much better. That's a crazy way of talking about the mice, um, but analogous to people and the youngest mice are emerging adults or, or, you know, sort of adolescent analogs did not do well. So there's something to be said for the endocannabinoid system changing over time and how we might be able to maximize the benefit of some of these cannabinoids and mitigate or reduce risk and harm. Great. Uh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Gruber, uh, for joining us today, for answering all these questions. Um, I think I've learned a lot. I hope uh, our audiences have as well. Um, this uh, uh, event is actually being recorded and archived as well on YouTube and Facebook, so you can uh, make sure to revisit it and check out that uh, all, uh, all the links to the content and the studies as well. Um, and thank you all to our viewers uh, for your engagement and for your great questions tonight. Um, we've really appreciated them. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting uh, for providing major funding for the cannabis question. Uh, if you're interested in learning more uh, about the story of cannabis and its medicinal uses, uh, please tune in to NOVA's uh, The Cannabis Question. Uh, Dr. Gruber makes a great appearance uh, throughout the film uh, and also highlights many other uh, aspects of her study um, during the film. Uh, you can watch that on Nova's YouTube channel. Uh, you can use the PBS video app to check that out. Um, and we will be back with our last Cannabis Conversation event uh, in early December. So please stay tuned. Um, make sure to follow Nova Education uh, on Twitter and Facebook for more updates on those events. And, um, and uh, yeah, we'll make sure to let you know and share those links once they are available. And so again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Gruber, for your thank expertise you. and thank for you. the work that you're doing and helping us understand uh, this topic and for taking the time to do this event with us. Uh, hope everyone has a great